Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Future Hacker. I'm your host, Maria Taigi, and today we're talking to Fernando Gutierrez. Fernando is a Uruguayan-born futurist based in the United States with a passion for space and science fiction, a focus on Latin America, and a drive to identify opportunities for emerging and developing nations to participate in space-based commerce and exploration. He's a member of the Association of Professional Futurists and the Grey Swan Guild, and holds a graduate certificate in foresight from the University of Houston, where he is completing a Master of Science in foresight. He's also editor of the upcoming book Ecofascism from the One Day in 2050 Collaborative. So, Fernando, it's amazing to have you with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, by your journey. You know, if you could share with our listeners your journey into the futurism and how your Latin background has influenced your perspective on the future. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, it's been kind of an interesting, it's kind of definitely been an interesting journey for me. It's, it's kind of an interesting story. I, I never even knew that... Uh, that being a futurist was was a career option. A um, thing, right? <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I'd seen them on TV and read articles and things like that, and I just had no idea how do people be, even become futurists. And then a few years ago, um, I accidentally stumbled upon the Houston program, and um, and it's been kind of a wild ride ever since. It's uh, it's it's been amazing. Um, you know, it's it's really such a such a passion, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, such a great opportunity to to um, uh, apply uh, lots of knowledge and uh, and learn new things and meet so many amazing people. There are so many amazing people uh, in the futures field and adjacent to the futures field, and so many people that you get to meet that um, that you speak to as part of research when you're doing futures work, and it's uh, it's just really. Um, I no other way to describe it. It's just been a, a, a wild ride. It's been a great ride. Um, as far as the the Latin American um, focus, that um, was kind of accidental, almost a little bit. Uh, you know, obviously born in Latin America, raised in the United States. You can tell I don't have an accent. Um, I speak Spanish as well. Um, but uh, and so that's always obviously been part of my life, part of my heritage. Uh, you know, my family. Um, we always spoke Spanish at home. Um, because we had family members that didn't speak English. But, uh, you know, when I got into futures, I didn't ha have that focus necessarily. But um, once once I, I started getting more involved in courses and projects and, and realized um, that in, in the United States, at least, there's not a lot of representation um, of, uh, of Latin Americans uh, or, or Latin heritage uh, in, in the futures field. And it just seemed like it was a very natural fit um, for me to, um, I feel almost become like an ambassador uh, in a way, uh, just because I, <laughs> I kind of, uh, yeah, right. I have a, a foot in both worlds. And so I've, I've spent a lot of time reaching out. There's a lot of wonderful uh, futurists doing amazing work in Latin America um, and just uh, kind of trying to, to get more of the Latin American point of view um, among uh, United States futurists and European fut it, anyone that I can speak to that's that's outside of Latin America, and then um, just trying to get some of those voices uh, heard as well that um, maybe don't necessarily get heard outside of Latin America every day. There's some amazing, yeah. vibrant conversations going on, but they're not always um, they're not always getting getting out and and disseminated what, the way they they should. So. Uh before uh, going to, to back to Latin America, uh, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, as you mentioned, the this community, right, of futurism and, and innovators, I have the feeling that it's such an amazing community. I feel that people are way more open to collaborate and to exchange ideas and exchange information uh, when you compare it to other regular industries. I don't know if I have the same feeling, but it's a way... way uh, I, I feel that people understand more at least the value of the collaboration and the exchange of information when you compare to some, some other industries. And uh, uh, talking about Latin America, and, and you mentioned that 
you know, we don't have that many people. So why do you, why do you feel that? Do you think that it's maybe cultural or uh, are there any uh, specific challenges that you notice when talking about futurism in Latin? Do you think that we are more, we're not there yet when compared to, to other regions when, when talking about, you know, planning for the future? What's your thought about it? Uh, a couple of thoughts. Well, first of all, in terms of population, um, you know, Latin America isn't as populous as, you know, Asia or, or even Africa. So in terms of sheer numbers, we're going to have, possibly have few, fewer futurists than in other areas. Um, yeah, it's also possible that that it's it's just um, uh, a, a, a field of study that's that's just becoming um, more well known in the region. Um, certainly, most of the most of the futurists that I deal with in Latin America are are younger. Um, in the, some of them still in school, uh, one or two that I know of still getting their 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 uh, their degrees or PhDs. So it, it definitely skews a bit younger. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I think also because a, a significant portion of Latin America is still emerging, um, foresight might be one of those things that. Um, tends to develop maybe a little bit as as uh, economies and, and uh, societies, um, you know, prosper a bit more. So it might just be mm. that that some some of the some of the regions are, are just kind of getting there. And you see it. I mean, you see a, a lot of it um, coming from places like Brazil. Brazil has a has a great um, foresight community. I've, I've spoken to some wonderful futurists that collaborated with some some amazing futurists from Brazil. Um, but then you'll see them in some other countries that um, that you know are are still dealing with with um, some issues, but you know working on on prospering live Peru, uh, Ecuador, um, in Colombia. I've met some amazing futurists from there as well. So uh, I think it just might be that it's a it's a very young still um, area of study. I mean, certainly, like I said, I I've. Mm -hmm. I've I love science. I love science fiction. I, I've, you know, as a as a kid, as a teenager, I read every book. Uh, <laughs> and to me, yeah. I didn't know that this was a, a possible career path. So it could just be that it just yeah. needs to be uh, more broadly disseminated. But uh, but I think even the greater challenge than the number of features in Latin America is just um, getting the message out, getting their voices heard. Yeah. Um, you know, and so you know, I've I've done. Um, partnerships to, to talk about things like uh, Brazilian Afrofuturism. So um, when, you know, Afro Afrofuturism has exploded, I mean, it's been around now for as, as a, as a, as a particular area, obviously Afrofuturism itself has been around forever, but you know, the discussion yeah. of the term, you know, the formal study of it has been around for a few decades, but really nobody's talked about, um, you know, outside of Latin America too much. Um, things like Afrofuturism, uh, Brazilian Afrofuturism, and Indigenous Futurisms, and things like that that are just now coming to the fore, and they're they're really powerful, and they they have lots of um, lots of similarities, lots of parallels to some of the Indigenous futures that we see coming out of North America and out of um, you know the, the Pacific Islands and uh, and places like that, but also you know obviously every you know, we're not going to lump everybody together. Obviously, every indigenous culture is, is unique, just like every every culture is unique. So, um, they've got their own their own perspectives on things and unique flavors, and and it's really interesting stuff and pretty exciting to 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 get involved in and uh, and to to see beginning to flourish now. I'd love to to get deeper into that. We recently did this. Uh our quantum thinking event on picturing the future through sci-fi's lens. And our guests, they did uh, bring up the regional futurism and this need, this need for diversification, representation. And that's actually how your name came up. Our dear Sylvia introduced us both, right? Uh, so could you share your insights on Afrofuturism and um, Amazon futurism? Uh, what role they play in addressing cultural sensitivity, representation, or broader themes, uh, you know, anything more specific is actually, besides quantum thinking, is the very first time we're covering more regional futurism. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really interesting coming from uh, from the perspective that I'm coming from, because 
growing up in the United States, I always considered myself, you know, obviously Uruguayan and Latin American. And, and I always lived in areas where there were lots of other people from Latin America, uh, people mm -hmm. from Cuba, people from Ecuador, Brazil, Argentina, uh, occasionally in Uruguayan. There aren't that many of us, so we don't run into each other that often. But, um, you know, lots, lots of different countries, uh, in, in Latin America. And so I always felt very much a, a kinship, a community, which happens also, you know, with, with, with people when, when you're immigrants. Um, but I never really um, had a sense of the diversity within our community beyond, you know, music and food, you know, certain cultures eat more of this or certain, you know, certain countries, their music is more like this, but, um, but really starting to to study more and, and read more and certainly the fiction, like um, like I just recently read um, Amazon Futurism, which is an amazing book. Um, it's such a an, an odd blend uh, for for a science fiction reader to come across. Um, it's it's uh, it's a little bit retro futuristic. It's a bit um, uh, it's echoey uh of um of solar punk to some extent and uh mm. oh, it really? feels like yeah it feels like something that would come out of uh an, <laughs> an afrofuturist perspective as well because it is uh essentially a story of uh, indigenous people and ancient technologies coming back to life um and uh and living uh among a very uh you know living a, uh, in commune with nature um but with uh, with lots of um advanced technology so um you know when you read it, it it kind of feels like oh this could be a little bit like um the wakanda but it's not um and it yeah. could be a little bit like like um um i don't know if you've read uh, or if you've seen um the comic book series um primos mm -hmm. Um, which is an amazing series uh, of comic books, um, and uh, and that recently came out. And it's essentially um, a, a set of cousins whose uh, ancient ancestors left um, left Earth with aliens, and and they've got powers. So it's they're great explorations of current culture and 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 older cultures of Latin America. Um, but through a, a, a sci-fi lens. So it's, it's a great way to kind of get an I idea flavor. Yeah. I found it yeah. interesting when you said uh, solar punk because, and, and that's one of the things that we discussed is um, usually uh, dystopian sells more, right? When we go to mainstream mm -hmm. uh, sci-fi and, and imagining the future, and we did have this discussion regarding, okay, so dystopian sells more when it's talk, we're talking about entertainment, but on the same time, is it a way of us uh, building a darker future because we keep always picturing dystopia versus what we want it to be and what we, we you know, uh, as much as it doesn't sell, but we are bringing a lighter side when you're talking about uh, regional giving example as, as, as uh, you know, Latin and Afro and indigenous uh, futurism. So do you see uh, by your studies that there might be a more positive sides of things? And, and, and do you agree with this uh, affirmation that, you know, we have more, more dystopian because dystopian sells more? And do you believe that by picturing too much of a darker fu future, we are somehow heading this way? Yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting. And, and certainly, I think dystopia has dominated, and certainly in the visual medium, right? Um, and when you look at films, when you look at TV shows, um, I think the, the fact that action tends to make a lot of money. Um, uh, you know, if you, if you did a, a solar punk um, movie, it might not be as exciting um, to the studios to produce, you know, I just read the robot and monk series, um, earlier this year. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful series of books, but there's not that kind of explosive, um, clash, uh, you know, violence, action, uh, struggle for survival, um, story that I think that, uh, a lot of the, the TV and movie studios, um, bank on, 
you know um there's a reason why michael bay has made so many transformers movies people like to watch things get blown up um <laughs> Whether that's the majority of people, I don't know. It's it's a lot of movie tickets that get sold, though. So so it's certainly popular that way. Um, in terms of of books, I think it's it it, it may be it may be a a, a, uh, a broader selection. It's not quite all dystopian. Obviously, you've got things like Hunger Games, um, which is very dystopian, and sold a ton yeah. of books and 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 became movies but I, I think there's there's plenty out there as well um you could argue something like maybe station 11 is kind of in between because there's there's some violence in there but there's a lot of hope in there too so um so yeah i you know i think it's kind of a spectrum but i think yeah the the more violent stuff is the stuff that kind of winds up um on our tv and movie screens um just because um i think they feel that it's easier to produce and easier to market than it is a complicated story um. So you know, uh, bringing foresight studies to the to the business uh, community, um, and 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 still, let's keep it in in Latin America because I know that at least in, I see a lot of of use in the U.S. in in some parts of Europe, uh, the use of you know foresight. Uh, companies already have their, um, I know many companies already have their foresight departments. Uh, how do you see Latin America using foresight studies to 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 their businesses and to being uh, more uh, prepared uh, for the future? Uh, do you see that this is this is you know spreading? And one of the reasons that I ask as well is that I, I just came back from a meeting we are uh, doing this project, a future hacker project for our boards, and I was talking to some board specialists, and they were telling me how as much as um, uh, board members are feeling the weight of being prepared for the future over their shoulders. There's still, at least when you're talking about Latin America, there's still not uh, the engagement and you know the the preparedness that we we should have from boards to to you know to 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 their own companies. So how do you see that abroad and also uh, in Latin America of people using those strategies to better prepare their businesses? Yeah, and I think it is critically important that they use them. I, I think the challenge with business in general is um, that business has become so um, so focused on the short term. You know, we're always looking yeah. at quarterly reports. We're always looking at um, you know the next projections. Um, that it becomes really, really hard to uh, get businesses, business leaders, to focus on on the long term. You know, when you talk to business leaders, to them long term is 18 to 36 months, maybe. And we're talking decades out often with, with foresight. We're talking 10, 15, 20 years sometimes. And, you know, when when you can get them to engage that well, you get a situation like Shell had in the 1970s where they were able to get ahead of um, the, the, the oil crisis. So, um, you know, there's certainly arguments to be made for for businesses to do that uh, for long-term success. Yeah. The problem is that there's so much incentive right now for short-term success mm. um, that it's really hard to, to, to get them unless it's a business that's really um, either a business that's not publicly traded um, so that they, you know, especially if it's a, it's a, it's a family owned business or if it's a tightly, you know, held business so that they're looking for long-term um, benefit. Then I think that, that, it becomes a bit easier, but when you're when you're looking to make sure that every quarter you're you're looking good yeah. to make sure that that your capitalization stays where you feel it needs to be, it does become more difficult. I think where there's a great ray of hope uh, uh, in Latin America in terms of futures is uh, is with governments because I, I know the government of Brazil um, has a lot of great work going on. Um, I've I know some folks working with the government of Uruguay um, on futures projects ongoing and they just hosted a future summit uh an international future summit uh for parliaments so there were members of of different nations from all over the world that came to uruguay to to talk about futures so um that was a great focus um great not just for my home country but also for latin america in general and for foresight yeah so um so yeah so that was that was exciting um wish i could have gone but um <laughs> but uh but maybe next time. Maybe, so, yeah. so, maybe next time. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
Um, so, Fernando, I, I, I know that uh, one of your passions is also uh, around space exploration, right? Yes. Um, I'm curious, so how do you perceive the importance of investing in space initiatives and, you know, how to make it a priority, especially when it comes to, you know, developing countries, uh, when the need to fulfill so many basic needs uh, end up speaking louder? How do you see that? Yeah, it's definitely a challenge, and it's it, even in even in the United States, you know, which I mean, we have ridiculous amounts of prosperity here. There's always still people that argue, what's the point of our space program? Um, but you know, when you see things that are happening on the International Space Station, um, experiments going on, and um, the results of that, whether it's new drugs or new technologies or new materials, um, or just even learning what it's like to be in space. As a, as a human body for months at a time, you know, when we think that we, we may at some point in the future have to venture out into space for long periods of time, um, not just for exploration, but maybe also for survival. Um, there's, you know, there's lots of, of important data that we, that we pick up from that. Also the fact that just aspirationally for the first time in human history, we've had people constantly in space for over 20 years. Yeah. There hasn't been a moment in the last two decades that someone hasn't been going over our heads at, you know, 30,000 kilometers an hour. So, um, so yeah, it's, 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 um, it's aspirational, but also, um, certainly it can be practical too, because, um, when you have space, you have, uh, infrastructure that needs to be developed. You have, um, engineering jobs, you have, um, you know, computer science jobs, you also have other types of work that goes on because when you build, uh, when you build a facility for space, you know, it needs to be built, it needs to be equipped, it needs to be maintained. So there's lots of opportunities uh, for jobs there. Um, in terms of revenue, you know, we've got Latin America sits on the equator. And in terms of launching, certainly for launching, um, equator equatorial launches, um, people don't realize one of the reasons that um, NASA has launched from Florida for so long is because it's one of the furthest uh, southern points in the United States. And uh, going all the way back to H.G. Wells, H.G. Wells theorized that the best place to launch into space would be from, um, actually he mentioned Florida, but you know, closer towards the equator. So the closer you get towards the equator, um, the the more initial velocity you've got because of the spin of the earth so um we've got that um going for us in latin america but also we have the fact that um way down on the southern tip uh uh we're also much closer to the south pole and you've got polar orbits as well different types of satellites spy satellites and weather satellites and other types of satellites prefer polar orbits over mm. um over equatorial orbits so the fact that it's such a nice long um, continent gives us the opportunity to launch in practically any orbit. Employment costs are lower. Um, there is a, a, a pretty high level of education in many Latin American countries. So you've got the opportunity, even if you don't have a full workforce um, enabled just yet, you have the opportunity to educate that workforce. And, uh, and again, once you start getting companies um, coming in and, and building facilities and, and launching from your country, you get so many benefits. I live in Florida in the United States and I live about an hour and a half from the NASA facility um, down at uh, Cape Canaveral. And that area has just exploded. I actually wanted to live there, but I don't live there because it's too expensive to live there. Um, wow. Because so many, so many uh, people have moved there. Um, people with, with engineering degrees and people that work in, in in the sector, so um, so it definitely brings prosperity um, and it brings outside investment, which is which is huge. And I think the other thing that it does too is it commits the the governments of of those nations to long term thinking, because mm -hmm. um, companies and industries don't want to invest billions of dollars in your country if in five years somebody's going to come along and nationalize it or in three years, somebody's going to get voted out. And then that infrastructure program that was going to bring roads out to your launch facility gets canceled. So, um, so it's definitely, it's kind of a, a win-win for both sides. It provides stability and it provides lots of opportunities and, and resources and, and revenue. 
So you mentioned both cases, but I wonder uh, when you see this the space exploration as an investment, do you see more on 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 the side of you know we are learning more about the universe as you mentioned, and and as a consequences we are advancing our own technologies, uh, or there's also the side of an investment for a plan B for a dystopian future. You did mention both cases, uh, but you know you, you I, I feel that you're more on the today's uh, advantages that that those investments are bringing us on, on, on making our own technology advancements and, and giving more access to, to, to regions that may not have uh, all the infrastructure, infrastructure needed, getting some abroad investment. So you see us more as something that we're getting value back today rather than preparing for a dystopian future or you just feel both you know i probably say it's in my mind anyway it's 80 20. i mean i i like i like the idea of having uh, uh some kind of backup plan but it's so hard for us to live you know 250 kilometers up right now um you know you can't do it without tons of support literally tons of support we send thousands of, 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 of kilos of uh, food and water and, and uh, materials and equipment to the space station um, every year. And that's just to keep three to six people alive. Um, so the practicality of space being a plan B, I think that's still way down the road. Um, you know, I, I do think that it is critically important important to think about it because you know things could happen but also um i think it's critically important to think about what's happening here at home as well you know it, it's hard to think about how we would make mars habitable when we're doing a really good job of making earth less habitable so you know we need to take a step back and think about that and i, I think we're yes. at the yeah yeah and i think we're also at the point in our culture where um Culturally, economically, uh, industrially, we have the opportunity and the ability to provide prosperity to everyone. And, uh, and you know, um, space is just one of the ways that we do that. Um, whether, whether it's through um, satellite technology, um, you know, you got companies uh, like Satellogic, which is out of Argentina, um, which is bringing low cost um, imaging to the world. So, you know, you've got the opportunity now to get, you know, high resolution satellite imagery that used to only be for spy satellites for a few dollars um, from companies like that. And uh, and so it's just something that it's an opportunity to democratize. It's an opportunity to to really bring prosperity. And and um, and lots of this technology is beneficial, not just to the companies that created or to the nations um, uh, that uh, that um, take advantage of it, but also to those that uh, that host it and, uh, and facilitate it. And how do you feel about this whole uh, private movement of just going to space? Like, do you see that more as an opportunity or is it something that should be more government centered? And, you know, I don't know, I, 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 I personally, I, I, I have mixed feelings because I feel that we still should have a lot of legislation, international or whatever, and upgrade on the space legislation in place going on. And, and the movement is already happening before we have some things figured out. There's this whole discussion regarding also space uh, debris and things like that. So, you know, I'd love to know your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those situations where I think you probably need to have some of both. Um, private does tend to do things much less expensively. Um, if you look at the cost overruns on NASA's uh, last big rocket, and it may literally be, literally be their last big rocket, the space launch system, the SLS, um, that they use to launch Artemis 1, um, the unmanned capsule, and they're, they're planning to, to launch a crude capsule, uh, Artemis 2, at some point. There's billions of dollars in cost overruns on that. And um, NASA's own um, watchdog um, group has said that it's it's unaffordable. So we've got some challenges there. 
Um, and certainly with the way the project was designed and implemented in terms of allowing for cost overruns and things like that. But I was there when it launched. I was I was just across the river and, and I got pictures and I shot video and it was gorgeous. It was beautiful to see. Um, and and certainly I think government can um, can provide some of that um, some of that kind of far reaching goal um, setting that's that's critical and also uh, can provide a lot of support and infrastructure. By the same token, privatization can make it more affordable. You know, when when you watch um, the SpaceX Falcon rockets launch and come back, and I've seen a few of those go up and return back to their their launch pad too. Uh, that's really impressive, and that's private. So, um, and that was done, I think, much less expensively, and certainly, you know, than than the SLS, but also even Starship is is much less expensive, and Blue Origins, uh, yeah. New Shepard, and is is less expensive as well. Um, so, you know, there's certainly opportunities there. I mean, again, you you do need rules, you do need um, legislation, you do need cooperation, like the Artemis Treaty. You know, the flip side of um, of SpaceX's amazing launches and landings is things like the situation with um, with uh, with their uh, their satellite internet, you know, which they were providing for um, for Ukraine during their war effort. But then uh, during a particular exercise, it's under uh, it's uh, it was discovered that. Uh, that the decision had been made to not uh, allow um, the use of their satellites during that particular um, engagement between the Ukraine and Russia. So that at this point, now you've got uh, a private company, considerably maybe one private individual, deciding that um, this particular piece of technology that's being used uh, in wartime, um, that they're just going to turn it off for that particular instance. And that's a lot of power for one one private individual or one private company to have. Yeah. And and that's also space technology. So that's that's something that that really needs to be thought through. Yes, that's definitely. And 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 whichever rules or legislations or whatever is defined somehow needs to be like globally. Like it needs to be like a some I don't know global definition uh, when it comes and and and. Honestly, not only regarding space, but all those new technologies that we're developing, if there's only local efforts, it's a losing race already, right? Because if each country decides to play by one rule, then it, it, it gets a little more dangerous, right, for humanity. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, you've got, you've got questions about how, uh, how clean it is to launch rockets into space, because even the rockets that, that, that burn hydrogen um, you know, hydrogen and oxygen, when it burns, it, it turns into water vapor and you would think, okay, it's water. It's no big deal. But depending on where it burns and how it burns, that can leave water vapor in parts of the atmosphere that, that doesn't normally belong <laughs> in those volumes. Um, other types of launches can also create pollutants, you know, in Latin America, obviously we've got, um, we've got the Amazon. So that's precious. That's something that we need to be careful of, and not just if we're launching out of out of uh, out of Brazil or or you know one of the other nations that the Amazon um, covers, but also if there's adjoining nations um, that maybe have less restrictive codes um, that wind up polluting the rainforest, and obviously that's that's a problem as well. So yeah, I agree. I think it needs to be an international effort. Um, you know the. Uh, the Artemis Accords was that uh, international treaty that's now been signed by a good number of countries uh, talking about how the moon will be used for, for peaceful purposes, um, mm. you know, which is, which is great. But if you don't sign the treaty, then you can kind of do whatever you want, you know, yeah. and, you know, as countries are racing to get back to the moon, it remains to be seen what will happen, you know, uh, if a country gets to the moon and finds a resource that's supposed to be open to all and they build a fence around it, then what do you do? Or if, uh, if your country goes and, and digs a hole and finds this amazing resource that be really beneficial, another country comes along and says, well, it's available for everybody, right? And they start digging it out after you dug the hole. Um, yeah. So 
there's lots of questions um, that really need to be put down um, because it is um, it is it is going to be uh, quite a quite a race and uh, and it could become a significant conflict like we've seen on back to science fiction on shows like for for all mankind i don't know if you've watched that's an alternate history but it's it's pretty amazing um uh, it basically posits if 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 russia if the soviet union made it to the moon first and what would happen and the space race just goes on for decades and uh you wind up having russians and americans uh fighting over parts of the moon so uh um yeah so some some really interesting thought experiments going on there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so, Fernando, uh, another changing topics here because you 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 have a couple of interesting topics that are within your your interest there. So, you also co-host the Motiverse Conversation, right? So, could you tell us more about the project and you know what excites you the most about exploring diverse topics across those multiverses? Yeah, and, and we actually, um, that is a project that I did uh, with Victor Catalan for about a year and uh, and folded that up now a few months back. So we haven't made any new episodes, but the, the ones that we made are available on, on, on YouTube. And yeah, awesome. so essentially the, the multiverse conversation um, was uh, looking at different, um, different aspects of, uh, or different themes through the lens of science fiction. And it was named mm -hmm. the multiverse conversation because the 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 theme was essentially what if if there are parallel or multiple universes and things happen differently in those. So we looked at things like relationships. But do you believe that? Do things. you believe that? In the in the multiverse theory? Yes. Um I I don't disbelieve. Or it's more it. like a like a spe yeah, speculative, you know. It's, it's you don't disbelieve. It's, okay, okay. Yeah, this is our it's part. it's absolutely no. It's absolutely a uh, a speculative tool when we use it for the multiverse okay. conversation. But uh, I don't disbelieve it because there are some well known physicists and scientists who say that it's very possible. Um, so is it true? Yeah. You know, I, I I don't know. They would know better than I would. And if they say maybe, then I'll say maybe. Um, but in terms of the <laughs> lens, yeah, in terms of using it as a lens for looking at, uh, at different themes, it's, it, it was a, it was a great, uh, it was a great experiment. Everything, like I said, from, from sports to relationships to education, um, we looked at through, through various lenses, uh, you know, we looked at things like, uh, like AI and, um, you know, just just finding different films and, and books and television shows that uh, that might show education, for example, or relationships in a, in a different light. You know, for relationships, for example, we had uh, examples like uh, Her, which is essentially... Mm -hmm. uh, Wonderful. Yeah, a man who falls in love with his AI. And then uh, uh, Blade Runner 2049, uh, which is you've got one synthetic life form falling in love with another synthetic life form, right? Because you've got a replicant falling in love with an AI. And um, uh, I'm trying to remember which other ones we had, but you know, uh, lots of different, uh, lots of different topics. We covered work and I don't remember all the other ones off the top of my head, but um, we had, we had a lot of fun. Um, and it's, and it's, it's kind of a quiz show at the beginning too because I would pick the films that we would talk about that month and no one else who was on, on the, the, uh, on the show would know what they were. So it would be a, a guessing game at the beginning. And after we went through the guessing game, then we would talk about, um, the, the, the topics. So, you know, for cloning, for example, um, you know, we had some really interesting properties come up and I would go back sometimes and, uh, and find some going back from the sixties or seventies. Um, you know, so, you know, I went, one of the ones for cloning was, uh, was boys from Brazil, you know, which is, a which is a thriller about, uh, Nazis in the seventies trying to clone Adolf Hitler. So, um, uh, yeah. And then there was another one, multiplicity, which is a Michael Keaton film where he just, he's too busy. So he starts making clones of himself and that one's a comedy. So that was, um, that was in between Batman and Birdman. He made multiplicity, um, so yeah, so it was just, it was, it's a, it was a fun device. It was a great opportunity yeah. a, to have a quiz show and get people to guess, but also to talk about these things. And I think one of the, 
one of the most fun things I had when I was doing that was when people would come on, um, we'd have guests on that were not science fiction uh, fans necessarily. And they didn't dislike science fiction, but they weren't they weren't fans. They didn't watch science fiction. They didn't read science fiction. So they would do horribly at the guessing. But um, when we would get into the discussion, they would have um, lots of points that you know those of us who are just so deeply um deeply involved in science fiction have it so ingrained in us wouldn't look at things necessarily that way because we're looking at it through our particular lens so getting those yeah those first slides was really 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 a lot of fun so great conversation came out of that Awesome. And uh, Fernando, one last question for you. So you mentioned that uh, you're working on your master's degree and a book, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, so I'd love if, if you could share a little more with us regarding both your thesis and your book. And, and by the way, I thought that the title sounds very provoking. I'd love to, more, to know more about it. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, so in terms of studies, uh, like I said, I'm uh, majoring um, in foresight at yeah. the University of Houston. It's one of the oldest foresight programs in the world. Um, not sure if it's the oldest, but it's right up there. If it's not the oldest, it's the second oldest. And um, it's it's a great program run by Andy Hines. Um, amazing professors, uh, amazing curriculum. It's all um, online. It's 100% online because it's University of Houston. Houston is very far from where I live. Um, I've never actually been to the, I've been to Houston, but I've never been to the university. Um, cause I went to Houston before I started going to school there and, uh, it's just such a great program. Um, it, there's a, you know, one of the, one of the methods for, for doing foresight is called the Houston method. Um, you know, uh, uh, so there's, um, there's a lot of rigor that they've brought to the field. Um, but along with that, there's also, I mean, you know, we talk about science fiction, we talk about speculative concepts. So, you know, we, we, we also make sure that we keep a, a broad perspective on things. Um, you know, Houston graduates, I've worked with Houston graduates um, that have gone on to work in uh, in businesses and worked with them on projects for their for their businesses. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great to have a common language. Um, but then also um, the fact that the courses are very diverse so you know there's things like uh that talk about systems so we we look at how systems operate you know at at, at the macro level and at the micro level um right now i'm taking one of the courses i'm taking is social change so just looking at how change happens in society and um and different societies and lots of different theorists on how um, those changes can happen um from older theorists like descartes through more modern theorists, um, and uh, and just uh, it, it's a way to kind of formalize um, viewing the world and viewing what futures might look like um, for the world. That I've just I've just found really uh, enlightening and, and just made such a huge difference. Um, made a huge difference in my life because I've. I've Learned so much and met a lot of people, but also made a huge difference in, in the way I look at the world. And uh, it kind of feels like um, like I had this in me, but it's really given me the ability to to bring it out and and yeah. and you know put a shape to it. Um, as far as the book, Echo Fascism, twenty uh, fifty, yeah, Echo Fascism is definitely a uh, it's a. Uh, it's an interesting uh, concept, right? You know, when we think of fascism, we think of of the right. We think of conservative. We yeah. think of oppressive. And when we think of of uh, ecology, we usually think more of the left. And and certainly in the yeah. United States, you know, uh, it's become a left and right yeah. thing. And yeah. uh, and right. And so to think of something like ecofascism, um, you know, I had actually started doing some more research on fascism and. And fascism is is almost more of a of a way of expressing um, concepts and 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 pursuing particular um, ideals than it is necessarily you know like like communism is a very specific um, uh, uh, you know type of 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 
society and socialism is a specific type of society democracy is a certain type of society but fascism even though in the 20th century it generally did tend to be much more conservative and and right-leaning and religious certainly in europe um, um pre-world war ii and during world war ii um and after world war ii um you know in spain up until the 1970s uh, very conservative very very repressive um it doesn't necessarily have to be um, it's more a manner of expressing um, thought and and forcing um, compliance to particular ideals. So, um, you know, I think there's a quote that, you know, it, every revolutionary becomes a conservative when the revolution's over. Um, so I think you could conceivably see that as, as a way of looking at it. Um, so in terms of eco <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of eco-fascism, it's really just looking at what happens if, if there's a totalitarian state that comes along um, in the next 30 years or so and declares that um, that you know the environment is 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 it is is you know our focus and anyone who doesn't comply is going to um, be met with with uh, you know with with harsh um, uh, with harsh action and so we've got. Um, several dozen authors coming at that from many different ways. Um, I'm coming at it from space, of course, um, and, and what that means. And so, um, you know, but if you think about what goes into environmental thinking and ecological thinking, everything from farming to, um, veganism, to materials use, to recycling, to pretty much anything you can think of is fair game and you know take that to the extreme and they don't have to be dystopian yes, but obviously okay. when you're talking fascism it's kind of hard not to be but um yes <laughs> also yeah is the I mean, I extremist all... view of echo first okay i got it yeah 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 no absolutely absolutely and also i mean if if you are on the quote-unquote winning side if you are a fascist then i don't know that this would necessarily be a dystopia for you <laughs> um or I, and i haven't i mean we're still editing the story so you know um there are some that are lighter than others um and you know if there are always people that believe that the ends justify the means so maybe if it saves the environment then maybe it's not so bad but we'll see once the book is out that's interesting that's going to be a very interesting piece of work i'm curious to see how it's end up okay Fernando. so it was really great to have you with us today thank you so much if you'd like to leave you know a last message for the audience please feel free yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for having me. And um, if I had a message, I would say that the future is ours. We just need to make sure that we make it a good one. Yeah. Okay, that's a great, a great message, really. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks, Fernando. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Maria. Thank you all for, for having me. Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future.